we're in the month of May, and we start a new uh, theme, a series this month. It's called Strong and Mighty. God, God wants to make you strong and mighty. He's the, he is himself strong and mighty, and so he makes you strong and mighty. You're, you're like him in every way. Kind of. You know, we're on, a, we're on a journey to be like Jesus. You know, we're not, we're not per- perfect yet, but we're, we're getting there. All right. If you ever think, man, I'm just kind of messed up and I hope I get it together, you'll get it together. It's just a matter of time. God is in the kingdom of heaven. There's, when there's a new heaven and a new earth, everything is completed. And we are completed. We're better, healthier, stronger, wiser. Everything we want to be, we are. We is. Strong and mighty. Let's, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy 17. Let me kind of set a little context before we get there. Uh, Deuteronomy was written by Moses and really talks about the journey of of. Israel that were slaves in captivity, bound, and their journey into being a great nation. You got to, as we're reading that, recognize that Moses received the assignment from the Lord to go back to Egypt he had left from 40 years earlier, started a whole new set of, of, of a lifestyle. Now he's 80, and God sent him back for the Israelites. Now, they have been enslaved for a number of, quite a long time, and they've they got a, a mindset that's full of slavery. And they're not, they're really not even a nation. They're just a, a group of people. And so God is forming this group of people into this mighty nation because he has a plan for Israel to bring the Messiah through Israel, Jesus, to die for us so that we could live forever with him. I mean, it's a plan. But the plans of God, sometimes because he's God and, he, and he's going to do it his way, it doesn't happen instantly. It's not just an overnight. It could be, but he doesn't just do it like that overnight. He, he allows us to walk in it with him. Why? Because he formed us from the dust of the ground, breathed his breath, the breath of life into us, and we became a living being, which has the rights, privileges, and power to operate like God. Listen. He could have made us where we didn't have any rights but he gave us rights. Or he could have made it so we don't have any power, but he gave us power. And so by him vesting into you authority and power with rights and privileges, when you do something crazy, he just has to go, "Ah, how long till they get it? Because we're created in his image and his likeness to be like him. And we've drifted from that. You know in the garden when Adam and Eve were, were, were growing and, and building intimacy with each other and intimacy with God. And God only gave them one requirement. You know the requirement. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat that. Everything else is yours. The whole place is yours. The houses are yours. The villages are yours. The pools are yours. They're all yours. Just, just one thing. Don't do that. Just, just a small test. And we didn't make it. Part of, part of the reason we didn't make it was because they had never known some of the things that we know, like lies. They had never, when Satan comes and he, and he tells them, did God say, they had never known deception and lies. And so he was, they were easy to be deceived because they didn't understand that. But they're accountable because he said, I only want you to do one thing, just one thing. Don't eat. Don't eat this. Just only one. Everything else, free. 
believe, but that one thing, and we couldn't do it. And so instead of God giving up on us, he started a plan to bring us back, to restore us in with full potency and power so that we can walk, talk, act, and live just like Jesus. And let me just tell you something. God's always going to finish everything he starts. He's going to accomplish everything he's choosing to accomplish in you, in your household, in your family, in your children, in your body. Don't worry about it. Don't get frustrated with the some moments that are just a little crazy. They're going to get some. There are some crazy moments. But we're going to push through that, and God's going to finish what he has started and be glorified. And we're going to look like Jesus, son of God and son of man. Now, God's going to prophesy a little bit and talk to Moses and tell him about the tomorrows. Deuteronomy 17, 14, he says, When you enter the land the Lord your God has given you, take possession of it, live in it, and say, I will set a king over me like the nations around me. Now, know that these are not a nation yet. You are to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. Appoint a king from your brothers. You are not to set a foreigner over you or one who is not of your people. Let's park just for a second. God, is, God already knows their hearts, and they're going to they're gonna want a king to be like the other nations. When God... Who is the current king over Israel? The Lord himself. He is king. But he also knows that the nature of humanity is, I want something else besides you. I want to, I want to drink that. I want to smoke that. I want to lie about that. I want to go there. I want to look at that. I want something else besides you. When there's really nothing greater and better than the living God. But he already knows, so he's not frustrated with it. He just said, hey, it is what it is. And here's, here's, when you appoint a king from your brothers, they're going to give you some hard stuff to do, but hang in there. Some leaders are elected, not God selected. We have a whole ton of leaders that we've elected. And, and and some of those leaders are good people, good leaders, good quality, love God, and, and, and a lot of them are not because they're elected. It's a whole group of people that we've got together and cast a vote, and then we elected this Yahoo, and then you complain about him halfway through his tenor. A bum, if I'd have known. Yeah, you did know. You elected him anyway. Some of those who are elected are also selected by God. God uses the process to bring them in. But some of them are not. And if you read the, the Scriptures, the Scriptures are full of leaders that weren't good leaders. Corrupt, liars, manipulators, deceivers. God still worked with them. Mm. They're not elected. And they're certainly not selected by God. And he gives the leadership a little, some qualifications. Here's, let's look at him in verse 16. He says, however, he must not, the leader, he must not acquire many horses for himself or send the people back to Egypt to acquire many horses. For the Lord has told you, you are never to go back that way again. He must not acquire many wives for himself so that his heart won't go astray. And he must not acquire very large amounts of silver and gold for himself. Let me, let me park there and look at those three requirements that God has given for the leader. If you're going to lead, these are some requirements, and everybody's going to lead. I mean, even if you're just leading your own life. If you're leading your own life, you have, you have a metron in you, common controlling me, which is a huge thing to do that you actually can control self at the right time. Know when to say yes and when to say no. So you see, the first, the first requirement that God says on your leaders that you're ultimately going to select 
and the requirement that's in each one of us is he must not acquire many horses for himself. Horses. What, what do horses represent? Well, in this case, they represent power and mobility. It's unbelievable. You know, you, you, you think about we're in a culture now, and we can go places and do things. But if you, some of us drove in here, and, you, and your car is, its power is measured in horsepower. Horsepower. Because how fast can you get there? How far can you go? Uh, if you were trying to go to Florida, you may not make it. You may spend your whole life trying to get to Florida. You may not make it. It's cause it's, and it's not even really that far. Now you can be in Florida because of horsepower in a car in a few days. You, you can be in Florida in a plane in a few hours because it's, it's horsepower. It's the power to do something you couldn't do before. You couldn't live there. You can't, you can't be in the United States and decide, I'm without a plane. I'm going to go to Europe. Are you going to swim there? You can't make it. So he said, don't multiply as a lead horses for yourself. Don't get so much power that you can do whatever you think you want to do whenever you want to do it. He must not acquire wives for himself so that his heart won't go astray. Verse 17. Listen, let me just... just when, when God knows that, that your wife is, is really what makes things tick. I mean, I can say something, hey, hey, hey. My boys are like, ignore me. And then Darius will say, knock it off. Yes, ma'am. I'm like, what is that? I told you guys to knock it off, and, you, and your mom comes in here. Well, it's just because of who she is. And they don't want to disappoint her. And they'll, they'll work hard to do stuff. Me, they don't care. <laughs> Little rascals. But I remember for me, when I was growing up, I honored my mom. I honored my mom. He says, don't, don't get too many wives. He didn't say don't get a wife. He said, don't, don't get too many wives. There is, a, there is a place you can get too many wives. Why? Why not? Why not have too many wives? Alliances. In those days, when you, when you got married, you just didn't marry this woman. You married the whole doggone pack. You, mar you married everybody. It was an alliance, right? They gave marriages as an alliance. So here's my tribe and here's your tribe, and now my tribe is marrying into your tribe, and we've now become one tribe, a bigger, stronger tribe, alliances. God was saying if you, if you form all these alliances, not, not too many, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take you astray. And then it gives a third one in verse 17. He must not acquire very large amounts of silver and gold for himself. What is that about? Because we all want silver and gold, a lot of it. Stack it up. That's about submission to God. So we got three things that God says to the leaders. Here's, I don't want you to do this. I don't want many horses for yourself, power and mobility. I don't want many wives for yourself. You'll go astray, alliances. And I don't want large amounts of silver and gold for himself because you won't be submitted to God. And sometimes part of the reason that we are working and serving and honoring the Lord now is because of the needs and our faithfulness to God. But you get somebody and you give them a billion dollars, and they're off. They're gone. They've lost their way. 
we've got people now who are on this planet who are billionaires. And some of them are good people trying to do good things, and, but a lot of them are just knuckleheads. They're loud mouthed, they're louder than everybody else, arrogant, prideful. They got money. But the money is not paper, it's just paper in a system. And you're going to exit the earth suit like everybody else. And you'll stand before the king, and he will, he will evaluate how, what you did with the resources that he gave you. That mean absolutely nothing now outside of your earth suit. Mm, scary. That's why you shouldn't have too much. You should, you should get enough that you can manage it. So you should be praying, God, expand my ability to manage the resources that you have placed in your servant's hands. And so he takes that and it multiplies, but it's not for yourself. With each one of these, he says, don't do it for yourself. No horses for yourself. No wives for yourself. No silver and gold for yourself. If you use it, use it properly, and you'll see what God does. Okay, let's go to jump to 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 7. Lord my God, you have, a new, you have now made your servant king in my father David's place. This is Solomon speaking. Yet I am just a youth with no experience in leadership. As Solomon recognizes, he's young. He's, he's got a, this monumental task because David, who is a great king, has now died, and Solomon is in the kingship position, but he, he hasn't done this before. Listen, sometimes when you haven't been there before or gone that, you, you don't worry about it. You don't quit. Or you don't shrink back. You just go to the Lord and say, hey, what's up? Can you help me? Because if God didn't want you there, he wouldn't put you there. And if he wants you there, he's going to equip you. So don't be afraid of challenges and be willing to go for it. Just ask God to go with you. Your servant is, a, is among your people you have chosen, a people too many to be numbered or counted. So give your servant a receptive heart to judge your people and to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? Now it pleased the Lord that Solomon had requested this. So God said to him, because you have requested this and, and did not ask for a long life or... Or, or riches for yourself, or, or, or death for your enemies. But you ask discernment for yourself to administer justice. I will therefore do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and understanding heart so that there has never been anyone like you before and never will be again. In addition, I will give you what you did not ask for, both riches, and honor, so that no king will be your equal during your lifetime. If you walk in my ways and keep my statutes and commands, just as your father David did, I will give you a long life. Now, he gives Solomon what he asked for, and he gives Solomon what he doesn't ask for. And he reminds Solomon that he has a pattern to follow, David, his father. And if Solomon lines up and does that, he's going to do well. And God gives Solomon this amazing amount of wisdom and insight. And he only gives him a couple of just a few qualifications. But listen, what, what good is wisdom if you don't use it? You have this insight and understanding and a relationship and a bond that you have with Jesus, and you don't, you don't take advantage of it. You don't, you don't maximize it. You don't, you don't take it to its highest level. You're just, you're, just, you're just always in this lukewarm water. It's never really hot, never really cold, just lukewarm. Your prayer, your prayer life is lukewarm. Your giving, lukewarm. Your worship, lukewarm. Your sacrifice, lukewarm. And then you expect hot and 
I want this thing cooking. I want to go to the next level. But you're, what you're putting out, though, is just lukewarm. I mean, you have to, you have to check yourself. What, what could I be doing that would heat up my life a little bit, right? So is, what's more important to you? Are, you? are you watching the game or, or in your prayer time? I'm not saying you shouldn't watch the, watch the game or shouldn't watch TV or shouldn't do some of those things. But you can't do those things over God, over your time with the King of kings and Lord of lords. Sometimes God's put you in a tough relationship, a tough marriage, because your partner's there to, to scrape off the rough edges. And when I first got married to Derzat, I knew that was her assignment. Because she was always pointing stuff out to me. If you stop doing that, and if you start doing that, and where did you go? I'm like, hey, woman, this is... And, uh, and the Lord would remind me. I'd go to pray, and he would say, I'm telling her everything. <laughs> There's nothing, Gordon, that you're going to do that I'm not going to reveal it to her. Clean up your life. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, you know why he was doing that? Because he had a plan for me. And the way I was living was disqualifying me from executing that plan. So he gave me a help me to partner so I could get there. Now, I'm just saying God has plans for you, and he's executing his plan. And if you disqualify yourself based on any reason, well, I'm, I'm too old now. Well, I'm by myself now. Well, I, I can't get this. Whatever. It doesn't make any difference to him. There's nothing. If you died, he'd raise you from the dead so that you could finish what your assignment is. And you need to hear that and get that in your heart, that your God can do anything for you. So Solomon asked for wisdom. And, but we know the requirement that's in Moses is there's three requirements. You can't. No, not too many horses, not too, many, too much money, not too many wives. So 2 Chronicles 9 says the weight of gold that came to Solomon annually. We'll see how Solomon does. The weight of gold that, that came to Solomon annually was 25 tons, 25 tons of gold. Can somebody sign up for the Solomon package? Besides what was brought by the merchants and traders. So he has 25 tons besides the gold that was, was brought by business. And all the Arabian kings and governors of the land also brought gold and silver to Solomon. Wait a second. He's 25 tons. Then the traders bring him revenue. And then the Arabian kings and governors bring him silver and gold. King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold. 15 pounds of hammered gold went into each shield. You do the math. He made 300 small shields of, ha of hammered gold. Seven and a half pounds, it's like a, a shot put. The seven and a half pounds is a woman's shot put. The 15 pounds is a men's shot put of gold. The king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. The king also made a large ivory throne and overlaid it with pure gold. The throne had six steps. There was a footstool covered in gold for the throne, armrest on each side of the seat, and two lions standing beside the armrest. Not two lions sitting, not two lions laying down, two lions standing 
by sides the throne, an ivory throne overlaid with gold. Now here's, here's one of the things Solomon is reaching for. I want you to come in here and go, whoa! I mean, he, he wants to amaze the people that come because he walks with God. What's your house look like? What's your car look like? You walk with God. Is it okay for you just to be mediocre or average when you walk with God? Now, listen, if it's just us and no more, ah, don't worry about it. we just us. We're already in. But we got a whole community that needs to see the spirit of excellence that dwells in you so that they can say, I want what you have. And it's called Jesus. At some point in time, you should be saying to yourself, it's time for me to go to my natural next level. I'm not going to hang around this mediocre place for the rest of my days. Twelve lions were standing there on the six steps, verse 19. One on each end. Nothing like it had ever been made in any other kingdom. All of King Solomon's drinking cups were gold. And all of the utensils of the house of the force of Lebanon were pure gold. There was no silver since it was considered as nothing in Solomon's time. It's the silver. It's like paper cups. <laughs> eh, just, uh, get that silver out of here, man. For the sh king's ships kept going to Tarshish with Hiram's servants. And once every three years, the ships of Tarshish would arrive bearing gold, silver, ivory, apes, peacocks. King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the world in riches and wisdom. All the kings of the world wanted an audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God had put in his heart. Each of them would bring his own gifts, his own gift item of silver and gold, clothing, weapons, spices, and horses and mules as an annual tribute. Let's, let's park there for a second. Did, did God say, do not multiply too much gold? Too much wealth for yourself. Did he say that? As, as a qualification for the leaders. Did, did, did Moses, Solomon, hit that mark? No, he didn't. He multiplied gold like, like silvers, like not even just paper cups. A silver goblet, you can't. Well, how dare you bring that to me? You know, he, wouldn't even, he wouldn't even go there. He had so much. It was unbelievable the amount of wealth that Solomon has. Now, he had great wisdom, so he was collecting things. But he got to a place, and here's the caveat in the word. It says that Solomon, you can't gather it for yourself. You can gather it, but you can't gather it for you. God doesn't have any problem with you having money. He has a problem with you having money for you. Well, the money's all about you. All about your resources, all about how fancy your car is, all about how good your clothes are, how much you walk, and, then, and how cool you are, and what you look like, and how much you have. He doesn't care about you having something. He cares about you having something and what you're doing with it. What lives are you changing? What other people are you impacting? How are you reaching out in the community to somebody that has not and reach across the aisle to bless them? It ain't about them, God. It's about me. Bless me. My prayers are about me. My desire is about me. That's, you're never going to get anywhere with the king until you have flipped this thing and realized, I don't have all this silver and gold for me. It's to fulfill the assignment God has given me because the earth suit is going to go back to dust. 
because it came from dust. Solomon, strike one. First Kings 11. No, let me go to, let's go back and go to Second Chronicles again, verse 25. Let's do Second Chronicles 9, 25. Second Chronicles chapter 9, verse 25, where we just were. Verse 25 says, Solomon had 4,000 stalls. Are we up there, guys? Second Chronicles 9, 25. Is what? We crash. Okay. Crash and burn. Don't worry, don't worry about it. Solomon, verse 25. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots. 4,000. 4,000. Can you say it with me? 4,000. Not, not like 100. He had 100 stalls. He had 200 stalls. He had 500 stalls for horses and chariots. 1,000 stalls. 4,000. And 12,000 horsemen. 12,000. Now, Solomon got this great wisdom, but Solomon was using the wisdom to just acquire stuff. He stationed them in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. Understand this about Solomon, though. There was never any war during Solomon's days because of the wisdom and the favor that was on Solomon. He ruled over all the kings from the Euphrates River to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones. And he made cedar as abundant as sycamores in the Judean foothills. They were bringing horses for Solomon from Egypt and all the countries. Horses. So we know he didn't do it with the money. He struck out there. And, and now he's got horses, mobility and power, that the ability to do things that no one else could do. Could you, could you imagine now? Understand their, their culture during that time. Um, when you went someplace, you lived there. You born there, you lived there, you died there. You didn't, you didn't really go anyplace else. Why? Because you couldn't get there. You couldn't get there. If you left, you're out with marauders, and they could kill you. There wasn't organized streets and roads and police and protect, protection. There was none of that. You were protected by your own family or your own clan, your own group. So you were probably, you, if you were born there, you lived there, and you died there. But not when you have mobility. Not when you have power. Not when you can go places and do things that no one else can go and do. So he had, he had money and influence and horses, mobility, more than anybody else to extravagant, extravagant numbers. And God is still God. So he's watching him flourish, and he's giving him great wisdom. He just has to use it right. So strike one. Strike two, certainly he won't have strike three. <laughs> certainly he's not going to marry a bunch of women. <laughs> Let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 11. Verse 1 says this, King Solomon loved many foreign women in addition to Pharaoh's daughter, the Moabite, the Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women. I mean, he just seems to me like he just loved a lot of women. From the nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them. And they must not intermarry with you because they will turn your heart away to follow their gods. To these women, Solomon was deeply attached in love. Um, and I don't, you know, I looked that up, and, but I think it's physically impossible for him to attach himself in a really intimate love relationship with each one of these women. 
I think it was about sex. I think sometimes Solomon's just driven by his desire to be with and have sexual relations with these women. And so he, and he's an, he's an, uh, he's a, he's a radical dude. He's always at the edge. And he's like that financially. He's like that with his alliances. He's like that in all of his life. I mean, he's got the wisdom of God, but he doesn't always use it. He uses it to a level to get things for himself, but he doesn't use it to honor the king. Because in his mind, he is the king. But Jesus. He had 700 wives, verse 3. 700 wives who were princesses and 300 who are concubines. So he has a thousand women, and they turned his heart away. Now, wow. I mean, can you imagine? I can't even imagine that. A thousand women. You listen, if you, if you went to one woman every night, it would take you years to circle back around to the same one. I'll see you in two and a half years. That's crazy. Seven hundred. And they turned his heart. When Solomon was old, verse 4, his wives turned his heart away to follow other gods. He was not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord his God, as his father David had been. Solomon followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Milcom, the abhorrent idol of the Ammonites. Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight, and unlike his father David, he did not remain loyal to the king. Mm. So Solomon, when he was young, he prays, God, give me wisdom and favor, and God gives it to him, but he doesn't stay the course. He has shortcomings. and He struggles at the end. Because he doesn't use the wisdom that God has given to you in a way that would have prospered your life to a new level. I want to I close just by reading Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13 through 19. So get those up for me, guys. I want us to grab wisdom and use it, but use it properly. Uh, the Lord has set, you know, this time in, in motion for us. And, and part of us, all of us are in this bond together. And God is desiring to do extraordinary things during this hour through you, but you have to do it his way. God, give me money. Man, I, yeah, but just if, if you're going to pray for him to give you money, ask him to give you money so that you can use it to be a difference maker on the planet. Now, I'm just telling you it's... Money is a trick. If you have a lot of money, I'm just telling you, it just makes you feel better about life and better about yourself. And you can do things that you want to do, and you'll do them. And you're going to say, I'll give all my money to the poor. No, you won't. You won't do it. You won't do it if you don't have a systematic plan and an accountability structure that allows you to bring in resources and a portion of it goes because it's hard to get Christians to even a tithe. The first tenth belongs to the Lord. You keep 90, I'll take 10. Here's the Lord's agreement. You keep 90. 90%. I'm going to bring resource to you. You keep nine tenths of it. Give me one tenth, and we can't do it. You can't effectively give him the tenth. When I first learned about it, when I was playing professional football, and the guy talk, talked about tithing. And I, and I looked that up in, the, in Strong's Concordance. And the tithe said a tenth. And I was like, this can't be a tenth of my money. A tenth, a tenth. He wants a whole tenth. I was used to in the Catholic Church. I'd drop in a couple of coins in the bucket. And, man, we're good. Key, peace out. If I put some greenbacks in there, whoa, we're really good. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you. God loves me today. I dropped a 20 in there. Hello. And then I got... Then I went to church, and these guys talked about a tithe. I looked that up, a tenth, a tenth. Devil, you're a liar. I mean, it's a, <laughs> the, 
I started reading the scriptures and everything. I couldn't, I couldn't elude it. I couldn't elude it. Here's what God was saying. I want you to put me first, not your money. Right. Right. Because he added this. Because I gave that to you so you could show yourself faithful to me so I could honor you as my son. So I said to the Lord, take it all. Take it all. He said, let's just start with the tithe. Because you can give me all, but I don't need all. I just need this. Give me this. So I started tithing. Then I started giving offerings. Then I started giving tithes and offerings, and then I started just giving stuff away to people all the time. You know, I started, started becoming a blesser, just made a decision to be a blesser. Proverbs 3.13, happy is the man who finds wisdom and who acquires understanding. Happy, well off, fortunate. This is, for she is more profitable than silver, wisdom is, and her revenue is better than gold. Depicts wisdom here as a female. She is more precious than jewels. Nothing you desire can equal her. And you're getting, you, sh you should get wisdom. Long life is in her right hand, and in her left hand, riches and honor. He doesn't give riches God's way. He doesn't give riches without honor. He gives riches and honor. He honors you. And blesses you and strengthens you and rewards you for your faithfulness. He get, when, when you walk with God and you're intimate with God, he gives you both riches and honor. No deception, no trickery, no lies, no manipulation. Her ways are pleasant and all her paths peaceful. Sleep good at night. Not worried about some of the drama that's circling the planet now. And all the issues and challenges that would so easily beset the world. But they shouldn't overwhelm you. You can't let the drama that we're walking through overwhelm you. There's a lot of drama, a lot of issues, a lot of hate, a lot of manipulation, a lot of deception, a lot of perversions, a lot of homosexuality, a lot of uh, lesbianism, a lot of uh, that. There's all of it. Listen, you're not going to stop it. You're not going to stop the onslaught of the garbage that the satanic kingdom has brought into the atmosphere during this hour. But you have overcome through the blood of the Lamb. Come on. Come on. Set your heart at peace. Set the compass of your heart at peace. I'm at peace. Wow, this is bad. And, and, and you know what they said? Ah, oh, no. That stuff's not greater than the king that I serve. And my heart's at peace. When he gives me something to do because I spend time with him, I do it. When he tells me what to say, I say it. When he tells me where to go, I go. And I'm, my heart's at peace. And you, you ought to get into a life habit of saying to yourself, yeah, I'm at peace. This is going to work its way out. And God will give you instruction. And when he gives you something to do, do it. Yeah. Now, it's going to take a practice, a life habit, but you can do it. Mm. What verse was I on? Tell me, guys. 18, she is a tree of life to those who embrace her. And those hold, who hold on to her are happy. Word happy is peaceful, well off. The Lord founded the earth by wisdom and established the heavens by understanding. Ask by understanding. Ask God for wisdom. Make her a forever companion. Partner with her in this life and in the next. She will elevate you. 
She fortifies, strengthens, makes you strong and mighty. She creates an atmosphere of peace and comfort. And, then, and with wisdom by your side, nothing can defeat you. In her embrace, you'll be happy. 